opportunity to share in this time of lecture, uh, but let me say to you that there are persons in the rear of the chapel who are distributing uh, note cards and pens uh, because following this time, uh, we will be sharing in a lunch and Q&A period. And so you have the opportunity to take those uh, note cards, put any questions that you may want to lift uh, from the lecture there. And when we share in the Q&A period uh, during the luncheon time, uh, those questions will be lifted as a part of our discussion. All right? If you're hearing me, say amen. All right. All right. Let me bid you good morning uh, from the Office of Community Life and from Wesley Theological Seminary. I am Reverend Dr. W. Anthony Sinkfield, Associate Dean for Community Life here at Wesley. And it is indeed an honor and a privilege uh, to have you to come and share uh, on this illustrious gathering of our annual Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture. It is exciting to see you. It is such a pleasure uh, to welcome you to this space and to this place uh, for this time of reflection, uh, this time of theolo deep theological thought, this time of introspection as we remember the work, uh, the ministry, uh, and the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, I will be ushering us uh, through this program on today uh, as we share uh, on this morning. Uh, if you don't mind, just look at someone next to you and just greet them and say, good morning. Good morning. Let us begin our time together uh, by um, not only ushering greetings to those of you who are gathered in this space, but those of you who are with us by YouTube uh, who are sharing the same. We welcome you, and we're so glad that you could join us in the capacity that you could. Our time together will begin uh, with our opening prayer uh, being led by our dean, Dean Fafi Clark. Uh, we invite him to come now and lift us in prayer. Good morning. Uh, before I offer the opening prayer, I want to read out the names of the nine. My brother Martin. In that speech, he talked about legislation ensuring equality. He dreamt about voting rights for all citizens. And he also wanted the dream to include an end to police brutality. And so I'd like to read the names of nine unarmed African Americans who have died already in 2022. Join me after each name. Take a deep breath. And may breath become air as you breathe out the air of resistance. Kekar Smith. Aaron Lamont Swan, Jr.
Elon och Neil Foster. Joseph Francis. Lamont Lee Lewis. Leon Burroughs. Patrick J. Boltwright. Keenan Anderson. Kyrie Nichols. O gracious God, creator of all life, the one who gifts human dignity to every human being. We gather today to confess that we haven't brought enough of the air of resistance against all that is an onslaught against our brothers and sisters and every sibling. Forgive us, O oh Lord, but also create in us the agitation that we saw and embrace and lift up in Jesus Christ. that we know also was gifted through the spirit and the work of our brother Martin. An agitation that was rooted in the reign of God and a dream that all siblings could live together in equality, with the right to vote and with the right to live in safety and not be terrorized by police brutality. We thank you for the saints that have gone before us, saints not just who have gone to rest, but saints that continue to agitate in your spirit. We offer ourselves, O oh God, to this spirit, the spirit of God that brings in the reign of God at hand, close, that which can be touched, tasted, so that all human beings can live in safety and security. We pray also at this time for Dr. Brown, Sister Teresa, you have anointed her, O oh God, to bring forth your gospel to the whole world. We pray at this time that you will appoint her at this time to speak with that same spirit that rested on our brother Martin and will rest on all those who agitate so that we too will be siblings for peace, justice, and mercy. Respectful of the many names by which your own children call out to you from all over the world, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For many, many years, the late, great Dr. William B. McClain 
would rise at this time in this service uh, to say the following. The first dean of Wesley Seminary was Harold DeWolf. He was Dr. King's thesis advisor. And he inaugurated uh, this lecture series, the first speaker being Coretta Scott King herself. In fact, I saw the uh, movie Selma a few years ago where it recreated the uh, walk over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And I looked at that line of people right in the front and everyone in that line, except for Dr. King, has been a speaker in this annual lecture. That generation is almost past. So is this just history? No, as Dean Clark has made very clear. And there is something we are working on here at Wesley that I think is worth mentioning. In our Lilly study, the, uh, studying the future of the religious workplace, one of the striking statistics we've noted is that the number of African-American women receiving Master of Divinity degrees from mainline seminaries has increased, many of them from Wesley. But the number of African-American women in major mainline pulpits has not. Dr. Brown said last night, that is a brick ceiling. And she is one to speak. She comes now and joins this illustrious line of people at this lecture as a mentor for so many African-American women and whose books, including Can a Sister Get a Little Help? addresses this ongoing challenge. So I welcome all of us to this annual Martin Luther King Lecture, and I thank Dean Brown for her leadership today. Thank you to both Dean Clark and to President McAllister Wilson. Let me say that we have also the esteemed pleasure uh, to have with us uh, to assist us in the spirit of this lecture, the chorale from the University of District of Columbia. Uh, they will come now and render selection and those of us who are able as they sing this next selection to stand, if you will, join as we sing together. Oh, 
Amen, amen. Good morning, Wesley and friends. It is with great pleasure that I introduce the 2023 lecturer for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture Series, the Reverend Dr. Teresa L. Fry Brown. Dr. Fry Brown is a bandy professor of preaching and associate dean of academic affairs at Candler School of Theology, Emory University. She has served Candler, Emory, and the larger, and the larger academy in various capacities for the past 30 years, including her role as the director of Black Church Studies for eight years and her 2015 appointment to the Bandy Chair in Preaching. She is also the co-chair of the Womanist Approaches to Religion group 
of the American Academy of Religion. And in December 2022, she began her tenure as president of the Academy of Homiletics. The Black Theology Project describes Teresa Fry Brown as the country's premier chair in homiletics. The AME 6th Episcopal District's Women in Ministry describe her as fierce, faithful, fabulous, and full of accomplishments. I agree. Even more, Dr. Fry Brown's life's work gives witness to these distinctions. In 2003, she became the first tenured black female professor at Candler School of Theology, and in 2010, the third black female full professor at Emory University. She was honored for her academic life achievements at the 18th Annual Black Religious Scholars Group Consultation at the American Academy of Religion in 2015, and as she received the Emory Williams Distinguished Teaching Award at Emory University in 2017, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Beautiful Are the Feet Award in 2019, the Turner Theological Seminary Lifetime Achievement Award in 2021. Among her many accomplishments, is her distinction as a preeminent scholar in womanist thought and womanist homiletics. A prolific author, Dr. Fry Brown has published five books, including Weary Throats and New Songs, Black Women Proclaiming God's Word, Can a Sister Get a Little Help, Encouragement for Black Women in Ministry, and Delivering the Sermon, Voice, Body, and Animation in Proclamation, publications with which Wesley students will be very familiar. She has also published numerous articles and book chapters and has lectured, taught, and preached extensively, both domestically and globally. Augmenting her contribution to the Academy, Dr. Fry Brown is an ordained elder and stalwart leader in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She is the church's 14th historiographer, serves as editor of the AME Review, and is the executive director of research and scholarship. I will add that she also has roots in the Baptist Church. And though she does not list it on her CV, she has mentored, provided guidance, and offered bread for the journey, both physical bread and words of encouragement to innumerable women and men seeking to faithfully respond to God's call upon their lives. Dr. Fry Brown is the proud mother of Veronica Tinsley Perry, and her son-in-law, Jonathan. And she is the very proud and doting grandmother of Jonathan David Perry, whom she baptized and welcomed into the Christian family on September 18th, 2022. Now, I would be remiss if I did not highlight the significance of Dr. Fry Brown's presence as a black woman in theological education and the role that she played in creating and continues to play in creating a path upon, upon which women such as myself, Dr. Na, others in this room, and so many others can walk with far less angst that might have been the case 29 to 30 years ago. I am particularly grateful to you, Dr. Fry Brown, because when I entered divinity school as a 39-year-old Baptist woman whose yes to the call to ordain ministry was less than popular in my own denomination, you affirmed my call and guided me as I developed a preaching voice that was uniquely my own. And when I began to imagine the possibility 
of pursuing a PhD and becoming a theological educator, you were the light that shone in the darkness of a context that was predominantly white and male as you embodied and exemplified the necessity and transformative potential of black women's voices in theological education as well as in the church. So thank you, Dr. T, for your presence, tenacity, ingenuity, and fearlessness as a scholar, teacher, preacher, and mentoring presence for the numerous women and men, known and unknown, to whom you stand as witness. Now, Wesley and friends, help me welcome our 2023 lecturer for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Lecture Series, the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown.
First, thank you, God, for this opportunity. I thank President McAllister Wilson, Dean Clark, Dr. Singfield, who set me up with the choir before. Thank you, choir, for the festival arrangement. I, I wish more people would sing that. Thank you very much for the festival arrangement. Lift every voice and sing. To persons who were on the faculty who were at one point in time my students, I've been here for a minute. Dr. Poe, Dr. Miles, Professor Himena, and all the former students I see on this side of the room. Um, this is this is this is nice. This is nice. I'm honored to be invited to present this lecture. I usually, when I stand in the pulpit, I know I'm going to preach, and I take my shoes off, so I'll leave my shoes on, so I will not be tempted to preach. <laughs> this morning because I was invited to give a lecture. The power of dreaming out loud. The power of dreaming out loud. I love language. I love literature. Nobel laureate, the late Chloe Anthony Wolfhope Morrison published her first novel at age 39. She dreamed of being a writer. She wrote how even now in her, her first novel was the now frequently banned since we are doing things in schools reminiscent of the 1940s. The bluest eye at age 39 because she wanted every homely little black girl who had ever been a joke or didn't exist in literature to have a reality check. Morrison introduced this concept of loud dreaming in paradise in which Consolata had an imaginative recreation of her life, where her past was substituted with a brighter future. In the Washington Post in 1998, Morrison writes, we humans are the only ones who can imagine paradise. So let's start imagining it properly so that it isn't about my way, my land, my border, my values, or keeping you out, or you, and you, and you. A dream is a series of thoughts and images and sensations occurring in a person's mind during sleep. In the lecture today, I would like to talk about a personal engagement with dreaming out loud, a brief analysis of Martin Luther King's dream, contemporary dreamscapes and nightmares, and my womanist musings about how to dream out loud. And so I enter this lecture as a 71-year-old black woman, a seminary preaching professor, an academic dean, a woman, a scholar, a social activist, an ordained itinerant clergy person in a predominantly African diaspora denomination that was founded on religious and social political protests but sometimes loses their way. I'm fatigued by the indelible nature of systemic injustice. I'm a weeping woman thinking about what her grandson will have to endure as a black boy born in these disunited states. I'm weary of the continued apathetic acquiescence, the existence erasure, the gentrified grouping, the jaundice justice, the mansplaining muteness, the mind manipulation, the monetized miracles, and the parasitic policing 
going on. I enter the lecture, a beneficiary of grandparents, parents, aunts and uncles who desegregated libraries and schools and stores and restaurants and housing in the 1950s and 60s, who proudly voted in every election because they said things were going to change. They, they taught their children to know and memorize history and poetry, literature, music, values, inventions, cultural contributions, faith, possibilities, and a family that was told they were nothing. I believed, I was taught to believe in a God that would make a way for them to be treated as equal, even though they were domestics and things. I was taught to believe, they believed that if they were good citizens and faithful Christians, treated everybody with respect, that in turn, they will eventually be respected. All the while being called boys and gals, except on Sundays, when they entered Ward Memorial Baptist Church at the corner of Pettus Street and Missouri Avenue in Sedalia, Missouri. There was a sacred space where janitors and chauffeurs, mechanics, road workers, farmers, maids, cooks, teachers, doctors, and lawyers could be called sir and ma'am and brother and sister. They dreamed of a life that would be better for their children, their children's children, and their children's children's children. They dreamed, they imagined life could be different that before it was a hashtag that their lives really mattered. I am the dream, I, I am the hope, the feeling of expectation, of the desire of certain things that should be happening in this country. I am the hope, the cherished aspiration, the ambition, the ideal of my ancestors and my lineage. My grandparents instilled a precept and example that I was to learn more to achieve more, to do more, to experience more, to help as many as I could, even though they were born at the beginning of the 20th century. Their sacrifices, disgraces, wounds, successes, joys, sorrows, and dreams were dinner table conversation and daily prayers, Sunday morning worship, and necessary activist learning, desegregating whatever they could. They, that library desegregation, I didn't learn about until I was 45. But they desegregated the library in Sedalia, Missouri because they didn't want their children to only have third hand, third hand books. As they kept children in their homes so they could go to the one segregated county high school in Sedalia. I embody the dream and the hope of my enslaved, disenfranchised, abused, raped, and lynched people. A child of the 50s and 60s, I grew up in Independence, Missouri. What a laugh. Independence, Missouri. Being called little black thing and gal. My paternal grandfather, Carrie Fry, was a Pullman porter and a chauffeur, and he would say, act like you have parents and don't embarrass the family when you go out. All the while telling the men on the back porch that he had a gun if the Klan came and tried to darken his door, having experienced too much death in his lifetime. My maternal grandmother, namesake, Tessie Bernice Ray Parts, would say, we all ain't Haggy's children. I mean, we were all made in the image of God, even when nobody else believed it. God will make a way out of no way, she said, being disrespected and called by her first name, by white children that she nurtured and bathed and dressed and raised as her own, relegated to entering stores by the back door without privilege of trying on items because her skin color was thought to contaminate the very things that she was paying for being in the first group to integrate young and Benton Elementary as a child. I was continually ridiculed by my skin color and texture of my hair, and that didn't end. When I first went to seminary, the same thing was happening. When I got on the faculty, the same thing was happening. But all the while being told when I was an undergraduate and even on the dean's list that I should go have babies instead of go to grad school. But my family continued to believe in the American dream and all it had to offer, even for black people, if one simply got an education, worked twice as hard as everybody else to be thought half as good. I believe freedom was possible because they said so. They hoped so. They believed so. They dreamed so. I too sang America as my brother went to Vietnam yet could not find a job when he came home for four tours of duty. I too sang America when my father drank himself into ill health because he reported no dignity in the world and was not thought to be a real man. I too sang America when I was told my engaged pedagogy and scholarship was not valued as others because it was too organic and too involved with justice things, you know, that black thing. 
So I enter this discussion remembering how much I've cried lately because dreams have not become reality. As a 12-year-old, there was a different kind of dreaming going on. Not a fairy tale, not Disney black and white movie replete with happily ever after Prince Charming endings. Not those that I watched from the colored balcony in all the movie theaters and RKO and 20th Century and Warner Brothers and MGM that no one ever looked like me. And the people that looked like me only sang and danced and served and smiled when nothing was funny and scratched when they were not itching. The pride of so-called race films from Jones and Hurston and Michaud and Roberson didn't get me where I needed to be. How could people act this way towards someone? When I'm sitting in church and I'm told I'm one of God's children, but when I leave the church, I am nothing in society. So I remember that August day, maybe you can see the clip, that flickering black and white image that's been replayed innumerable times. Various counting agencies number the crowd between 200 and 400,000 people representing all of God's creation gathered at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial on that sweltering day. Some had walked and hitchhiked 700 miles just to be part of a protest for jobs and freedom. Some had been present since 8 a.m. that morning sitting around the shallow reflecting pool. Others who represented the artistic expression, singing protest songs, reading James Baldwin poetry and offering monetary support. Asa Philip Randolph, a part of the nine-member planning committee who had been waiting on promises since he postponed the 1941 March on Washington for equal government hiring, was present. Ella Baker and Bayard Rustin had worked years behind the scenes for universal fellowship and human rights now anxiously rejoiced because their dreams could be actualized, because they were told they would embarrass everyone if they saw them in front, particularly Bayard Rustin, because he was gay. Justice? They had to be hidden figures on that day. Publicly invisible also on the program were females, essential frontline grassroots organizers, activists like Joanne Robinson, Daisy Bates, Rosa Parks, Diane Neville, Septima Clark, Polly Marriott, or even Ella Baker, whose refrain at that time was, our time will come as male justice seekers capitulated to 20th century gender roles. Whitney Young, Roy Wilkins, John Lewis, and the only woman on program, Josephine Baker, already critiqued the conflict in this promise, this promotion of equality on paper, but when would it be put into practice? 3,000 plus came to report the news to the world, and 1,000 plus militia, police personnel were armed and ready in case something happened to the peace that we enjoyed in this country. J. Edgar Hoover and his wiretapped attendees promoted character assassinations and breached privacy in the name of security and patriotism. 100 plus politicians suspended their personal agenda to stand in the ground. Preachers left separative worship sanctuaries and individual pulpits to stand supposedly in solidarity of the cause. Let me pause right here. We do know, we do know that 75% that of black preachers did not follow King's dream. I just had to put that in there in case y'all get mixed up later on when I'm talking. But anyway, <laughs> that's called going off the paper and preaching in case you wouldn't know what that is. The so-called Camelot president watched the proceedings as he deliberated signing a piece of legislation that would be the first step to extending collective civil rights. Generations unborn on August 28, 1963 would come to know the words by heart with this average-sized, well-educated, passionate man in a dark tie, white shirt, delivering the closing address. Michael Jr., the middle child of Michael Sr. in Alberta, the baby brother of Willie Christine, the older brother of Alfred Daniel Williams King, who was renamed at age five by his father in the name in honor of German theologian Martin Luther. The 1944 Morehouse College freshman at age 15, a preacher scholar who stood on the precipice of extraordinary prophetic myth, a man who learned the ethic of love and the crucible of faith in his father's church, which he never pastored, by the way, and at the organ bench of his mother, Alberta, was about to move the nation, a world with words. He learned through the teaching of seminary professors in Atlanta and Rochester and Boston. His life intersected the experiences of countless freedom activist names. He memorized the preamble, the foundation of what we should dream about in the United States. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. 
ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promise the gen promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity if they look like us. I try to re-envision Martin King's face that day, as if it was originally captured in high def, curved or Roku or smart screens, almost feeling the sweat cascading down his face. We could hear the poetic proclamation of freedom in his voice with the digitally enhanced pulsing orb theater speakers. Some said amen, some cried, some sang, some recited words of the challenging melodic rhetoric of that day, the camaraderie of the day, the urgency of that day, seemingly frozen in time. 187 years after John Hancock, Samuel Adams, John Adams, Robert Payne, Eldred Gary, et al. penned in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths. To be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. My family, even my cynical father, sat around an RCA cabinet television waiting for this culminating message and the repercussions of this march. I couldn't believe someone had the courage to stand in front of all those people and said what he was going to say. After all, there were still places in Missouri where we, people that looked like us, were beaten off the street at sunset. They were told to walk past and move out of the way and never look a white person in the eyes. As Martin took the platform, he invoked the style of classical black preaching. Partly newly researched and written, partly refiltering of old sermons and speeches, he began to talk about the dream in the late 1950s in a speech in April 10th, 1957 in St. Louis called, I Have a Dream. It addressed religious leaders in, when he was addressing religious leaders in 1959, he spoke of American democracy as a dream unfulfilled, a dream of equality of opportunity, of privilege and property widely distributed, a dream of land where men will not take necessities for themselves, but give the, luck, excuse me, take the necessities for, from the poor, a dream where we're glad that we're not arguing that what the government is doing it, to determine the content of one's character, where we recognize that basic thing about a man is not his specificity, but his fundamentalism, a dream of a place where all our gifts and resources are held, not for ourselves alone, but as instruments of service to the rest of humanity. He talked about the dream, a dream in 1960, the Negro and the American dream, where delivered at the annual freedom meeting in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, where he said it's a dream of a land where a land where all, all colors increase together. In Albany, Georgia, in 1961, he talked to a stick worker named Prathia Hall, who spoke of having a dream about a beloved community and about freedom faith which means you keep going no matter what they're doing. His speech that day was peppered with his personal beliefs, those that Rufus Burroughs talks about in Martin Luther King Jr. and the Theology of Resistance. He talked about his personal beliefs about black church, the prophetic tradition, about Gandhi, about nonviolence, about social gospel, about liberal theology, that one has a personal relationship with God, that there's a sacredness of all humanity, that we have an ethic of love, that we're supposed to be involved in social activism, that there's an indivisibility of all humanity, that God is on the side of truth and justice, influenced by his father and his mother, Benjamin Mays and Kelsey and Brightman, his dissertation about the doctrine of God, looking at the thinking of Paul Tillich and Harry Wyman, parts of his mantra were infused in the speech. Theodore Parker's The Ark, the arc of, of the moral universe is long, but bends toward justice. Carlyle's that no lie can live forever. Cullen Bryant, the truth crushed to earth will rise again. He kept dreaming about these things. This message, part contemporary, extemporary, some call and response, this emotion, this enlivened audience, he kept going that scheduled four minute closing speech prompted by Mahalia Jackson's tell them Martin, tell them about the dream, morphed into a 17 minutes, 27 seconds, mini proclamation. As he stood there discarding his prepared notes and launching into his dream of reclaiming the soul of America where everybody was equal, people listened. 60 years after that day, it seems as though the promise of that moment 
the impetus for a movement toward universal freedom, the prophetic urgings toward a beloved community, the activist demonstration of global liber uh, liberty and justice for all, the prophetic call to end wars domestically, internationally, the countless sacrifices, the depth of intellectual interrogations, the innumerable sermons that help somebody logic has been entombed in an annual dreamscape where we recite the words and do not take them to heart. 17 days after the I Have a Dream speech, Sunday, <clears throat> September 15th, 1963, Bobby Frank Cherry, Thomas Blanton, Herman Frank Cash, Robert Chambliss, and members of the United Clan of the United States, a Klan group, planted a, detonate, a delayed detonating box of 19 sticks of dynamite under the steps of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham near the basement. About 10.30 a.m. when 26 children are walking into the basement. Addie Mae Clark, Denise McNair, Carol Robinson, Cynthia Wesley, and 20 more were killed. 20 more were injured. That same day when the preacher was going to preach the love that forgives. Two other children were killed that day also, but we forget their names sometimes. Think about where we are. More things follow, the death of Kennedy, the deaths of Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, the Democratic Convention where Fannie Lou Hamer said that there was nothing there for blacks in America, the failure of the first march in Albany. King had to know the paucity sometimes of a dream. We recite the dream, but do we take it to heart? A review of Dr. King's speeches between August 28, 1963 and April 3, 1968, did not focus on contemplative dreaming. It did not focus on saying words over and over and over again. It did not focus on vapid rhetoric. It did not focus on, let's just be politically correct. It did not focus on people that hate black and brown bodies reciting it on his birthday as if they believed it in the first place. No, if we look at his words following that time, he began a wide awake engagement, a dreaming out loud about prejudice, oppression, sins, and even the war. He spoke and he preached about universal human rights and economic equality, the end to an unjust war, and tolerance for religious difference. He told an audience in Mississippi, I quote, I am sick and tired of violence. I'm tired of the war in Vietnam. I'm tired of war and conflict in the world. I'm tired of shooting. I'm tired of selflessness. I'm tired of evil. I'm not going to use violence no matter what they say. Aren't you aware that these words are being said in pulpits and on street corners and in protests even in 2023? I believe King resonated with German theologian Bonhoeffer. The world, quote, the world needs hope to deliver itself from fear and faint-heartedness. Hope keeps us from being paralyzed and gives us courage to act, keeps us from self-destruction. Hope is the potential for renewal. Sometimes, Camus says, change is a struggle to death between the future and the past. What are we doing? What are we dreaming? What about our own dreams? What about our own marching orders? We may not have 200,000 people watching us, but what have you envisioned lately? And what have we done about it? King dedicated 12 years and four months of his 39 years from his election as spokesperson from Montgomery Improvement Association until his death in Memphis to being actively dreaming and doing something about the words that came out of his mouth. Here we stand in 2023, 50 million people in poverty, 49.1 Americans go to bed hungry every night and 34 million adults and 16 million children uh, in bed at night with no food, food insecure. 1.5 million people a year experience homelessness and that's just the ones we count. 43 million have no health insurance and we do political pandering because we don't want someone to have their name on a health care bill and people are dying for lack of health care. But we're reciting the I have a dream speech. Too many have become numb and comatose and incapacitated. 43 mass shootings in the month of January alone. 1,176 1, persons are killed 
per month, 100 per month in 2022 by police. Protect and serve. 89,000 black women have gone missing since 1978 and nobody looks for them. Silent genocide that only their families know about. 600,000 children report abuse. Two million people are in jail in this country, the land of the free and the home of the brave. 38% of them look just like me. The preponderance of gentrified and regentrified neighborhoods and gerrymandering are reminiscent of the 1890s pseudo-promised land great migration. 27 million people are humanly trafficked for forced labor and sex work. Maybe we've just given up. Maybe the mountaintop vision of King is just too much for us. Maybe the valleys have become too low. After all, we thought about the humanity that happened in 1619 at Jamestown was over. Maybe we thought chattel slavery and cargo culture of the 1440s to the 1863s were over. Maybe we thought women got to decide what to do with their bodies. After all, the men came out of their bodies. Maybe we thought binging on reality shows and Netflix originals and has supplanted the realities of the fragmentation of the American dream. Maybe we're just tired. Maybe we're just sleepy. The Mayo Clinic says sleeping too long can be problematic. Dreaming uninterrupted is also problematic. It's that rapid eye movement or dream sleep that renews the mind. Maybe we haven't slept deeply enough and then awakened to do something. Maybe our bodies have not wrestled enough and we're paralyzed and, and, and we're not doing what we need to do. Maybe we are externally paralyzed or anesthetized by a promise for change, but we don't want to hurt anybody's feeling or lose our position or our status or our title or our church or our school or our bank account. Maybe oversleeping can be linked to health problems and can lead to death. Oversleeping leads to fatigue. Maybe we just have so much justice fatigue that we would just throw up our hands and pretend everything is all right. Maybe we've domesticated Martin Luther King so much in his articulated dream that it's better just to talk about it one time a year. Maybe we're afflicted with reactive recidivism and selective silence, annual amnesia, passive politics, limbing leadership, comatose commitment, or socialized somnambulism. In 1951, the year of my birth, Harlem Renaissance poet, novelist, and playwright, columnist Langston Hughes put it this way in his poetry collection, Harlem. What happens to a dream deferred? D does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? God, I'm tired of reaction and not action. I'm tired of every time we get to look at the news, people react for 15 minutes and go back to business as usual. Maybe we have weaponizing exegesis of King's words for political patronage. Maybe we're so comfortable with the status quo, we don't want to act. Maybe we thought we achieved the American dream, at least until the next Supreme Court ruling. Dreaming out loud is active engagement, not reactive to social media-driven photo ops. It's, with, it's not with all deliberate seed. It's not waiting to the next leader. It's not seeking permission to be the persons that we know God called us to be. It's not proffering laws to erase people from textbooks where we fall in line because we fear the person doing it will be the next president. In his book, Inconvenient Hero, the late Vincent Harding, historian, civil rights activist, speechwriter for King, Nonviolent Actions, reminds us, about King, for his greatness may rest not so much in the dream, but in his willingness to continue in hope, to struggle, to develop new vision, to call others to a new American fight amid, amid the nightmares of despair and the broken bodies 
In the light of that nightmare, he had to re-envision the dream. Why are we reciting the same words from 60 years ago? Re-envision the dream. Learn to think out loud. Do a re-memory. My woman is imagining and my active womb work leads me now to move to the musings of my intellectual partners. Bell Hooks talks about it's time to decolonize our minds. We have the dual tools to break the dominator's mold, but we set and we just set and we just set and believe everything somebody tells us and don't ask a question because we don't want people to think we don't know something. My grandmother said the only way to learn is to ask questions and probe deeply. Why are we going around like we are just mindless and following whatever anybody tells us because we want everybody to like us? You will die being liked and ignorant. Samuel DeWitt Proctor once said, believing that change is possible calls one to act in harmony with faith because you believe and believing makes it so. It's the substance of things hoped for. Faith is operational, but you have to dream about it. You have to believe that something can happen. Du Bois talks about counter memory as a reconstructive strategy. Look at what's in front of us. Look at what history is. Reconstruct it, deconstruct it, but for God's sake, give us something after you deconstruct it. Memory becomes a personal activity where we can lose our words to make new horizons and the way things can be to shape a world. My womanist leaning say, we all have agency. Why are we waiting for the next leader? when everybody in this room can be a leader. Use your agency. Carpe diem, it means that you're responsible for your own healing. Stop waiting for a savior. The one we worship was on a cross and is gone until it's time for the parousia. Stop waiting for a savior. Get out there and do the work yourself. Stop waiting for somebody to call a protest. Stop being humble and, and when somebody treats you like trash in a store, I don't want to cause any problem. Well, what about the person that doesn't have the wherewithal to even ask the question? It means that we learn to get up and get our own water. That we speak our own mind without others to put words in our mouths and hijack our thoughts or silence our beliefs. It means that we survive and thrive in a world because we practice love of ourself and stop waiting for someone else's affirmation that we have self-discipline, that we determine where we're going to be and when we're going to be, that when there's moral injury, find somebody else that can talk you through it and stop going along to get along. It's Foucault's counter-memory that moves us to reconsider the flawed histories, where we disrupt what's going on around us, that we, look, we, we stop looking past microaggressions because those become macroaggressions. And then you get tired and you don't know what to do. Address it when it comes up and stop swallowing what you think. Women have something called traditional communalism which says that God intends us to be free and assist us to it. Stop waiting for a law to make you free. It ain't coming, folks. The webs of oppression are legion. Because you are working on one area does not mean somebody else's area is inconsequential. That everything affects everything. The marginalization, the exploitation, the imperialism, all are about power. My ism today will be your ism tomorrow if we don't start working together. Stop blaming people. If they're not interested in racism right now, that's fine. You work on racism, boo. Let them work on what they're working on. Because what happens is we raise up one leader in this country, and it's easier to knock off one leader than it is to walk, knock off 2,000 of them. So why are we always pouring our energy into one person? That's what we should have learned from watching King. King wasn't the entire civil rights movement, but we act like that. And then we sit around when you knock off the leader and say, what's we going to do now? No, everybody is empowered to dream and to lead. Yeah. Audre Lorde said, watch the tyrannies of silence. We need to transform even the silent spaces into action to use our voices. She talks about our silence is not going to protect. I love the end of the litany for survival. And when we speak, we are afraid. Our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it's better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. 
Let them make fun of your dialect, but open your mouth and say something. Let them make fun because you can't pronounce the word in Greek and Hebrew. They can't either. They went online and did it with a little speaker online. Let them do all that stuff. But you go ahead and speak what God has placed in you. You have vocal folds. You have a mind. Speak your words. Like Zora, Neil Hurston, quote, I had the nerve to walk my own way. However hard the search for reality rather than climb into the rattling wagon of wistful illusion. Speak up. Break the silence. Use the words that you have and do what God has appointed you to do. Work even when you're resisted. Work even when you're tired and take time to lament. We're in a society that they want to applaud everything. That's why they give ribbons to everybody whether they can compete or not. But the lament, as Luke Powery talks about it in his book, the lament means that we allow ourselves to be honest before God and grieve what's going on and complain. But after the lament and recognition of your pain, get up and do something. Get up and do something. Girl, go ahead and learn and understand and leave the crooked rooms. The crooked rooms comes from an experiment in post-World War II on cognition. And they would construct a room that was leaning 35%. And they would put a person in the room to see if they would adapt to the room or stand up straight. I declare too many people are adapting <laughs> instead of learning to stand up straight in a room. Don't be in a box. You can only be in a box if you allow them to put you in the box. Lock the door and close the key. Stand up straight. Stand for what you align yourself with your godliness. Despite all the recent proclamations of this is not my grandmother's church, the truth of the matter is all dreams and warning and instructions were given by people that had some knowledge that we do not possess. Community sayings and live moral rhythm will take you further than anything. Dolores Williams says, examine your faith. Begin to question authority to articulate suffering, to name, to discord the destructive images and symbols and create divisions of individuals within a social structure. Re-examine your faith. These are people to be unconscious instruments of their own oppression and oppression of others. Listen to the people that have been where you are trying to go. It's not that they don't want you. They don't want to see you walk through the glass that they've already are, are there for. I have, this is not on the paper. It's a preaching moment. I have developed in my years teaching an alcohol, cotton, and tweezers ministry. I will warn you on this side what's coming. If you don't listen to me and go through the glass anyway, I'll be on the other side with alcohol, tweezers, and some cotton. I won't tell you I told you so, but I will listen as you bemoan it, and then I'm going to say, now what are you going to do? If I can keep you from falling, why not? I have a friend, Tony Beelan Ingram, who says, I'll help you if you let me. But somehow we have developed in this youth-oriented society that anybody over the age of 50 is ignorant and knows nothing. I'll leave that there. I believe Dr. King was languaging the power of dreaming out loud, imagining the already and the not yet, imagining equality, fully awake and fully engaged. In his last SCLC presidential address, where do we go from here, he challenged us to reimagine the future, much like the Morrison character, even in the face of justice fatigue, to keep doing the work, to put in the justice time, to move ahead from divine dissatisfaction. He said, and I quote, let us be dissatisfied until America will no longer have high blood pressure of creeds and anemia of deeds. Let us be dissatisfied until the tragic walls that separate the outer city of wealth and comfort and the inner city of poverty and despair shall be
be crushed as battering rams before the form, before justice. Let us be dissatisfied until all those that live on the outskirts of hope are brought into the metropolis of daily security. Let us be dissatisfied until slums are cast into the junk heaps of history and every family is living in a decent sanitary home. Let us be dissatisfied until dark yesterdays or segregated schools will be transformed into the bright tomorrows of equally integrated education. Let us be dissatisfied until integration is not seen as a problem, but as an opportunity to participate in the beauty of diversity. Let us be dissatisfied until men and women, however black they may be, will be judged based on the content of their character, not based on the color of their skin. Let us be dissatisfied. Let us be dissatisfied until every state capital houses a governor who will do justly, mm who will love mercy and who will walk humbly with his God. Let us be dissatisfied until every city hall, justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let us be dissatisfied until the day when the lion and the lamb shall lay down together and every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree and none will be afraid. Let us be dissatisfied when men will recognize that we are one blood, one blood in God and all people dwell together. I end the words with a woman who was the hidden architect of the modern civil rights movement a woman who dreamed out loud, Ella Baker intoned, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it's done. Dream out loud. Walking in the land, walking in the land, and ringing the bells. I know, oh, my Lord is walking in the land, walking in the land, and ringing the bells. I know, oh, my Lord is walking in the land, walking in the land, and ringing the bells. I know, walking in the land, walking in the land.
What a blessing this morning has been, amen. I honestly leaned over to uh, Dr. Teresa Fry Brown and said to her, I could not tell if you had your shoes on or off. <laughs> we will have the good pleasure of continuing to share with her uh, during our time of lunching in our refectory, uh, which is our dining hall, for some of you who don't know that language. Uh, we will be sharing in a lunch and learn Dean's Forum with uh, our featured lecturer on today. And so we certainly invite you all to come and share in the same wonderful meal, wonderful time of community. And our Association for Black Seminarians will be leading us in this discussion as we share together. So let's prepare to go with the blessings of God. Let's look to God together. God bless us. God keep us. God bless our food and fellowship together and enable us, oh God, to dream out loud. In Christ's name, amen. Some of our students will help to direct you to the refectory, those of you who are coming. We are so glad for those of you who will not be able to stay. Thank you for coming and sharing with us. Our own Dean, uh, Sathya Clark, will assist us in getting our lecturer down uh, so that she